Hey T Heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. Yeah, it's a special day today because today I'm getting to try for the first time in a few months a right poor tea that really, really knocked my socks off, knocked our socks off when Celine and I tasted it <clears throat> earlier this year. We really loved it. We were so excited to bring it in. Finally, the day has arrived. This is Milk Float Nomad. And if you liked After Party Enchanter, for those of you who picked up After Party Enchanter, then this will be one of your best friends. This is After Party Enchanter. And this we're calling After Party Enchanter 2, although it stands in its own right, the Milk Float Nomad. For those of you didn't, who don't know, little known fact, bears and seals are very closely related. In fact, seals are apparently the most closely related species to bears. So we figured let's you know, bring in that relationship by making this cake a seal. This is Milk Float Nomad. So the seal sitting on top of a meringue, floating on top of custard with a milk biscuit in the background. I guess you can start to pick up some of the flavor notes that we first tasted when we tasted this tea for the first time. As I said a few months ago, it's been pressed for us. We're so excited. This is a spring 2010 Bulang Gong Ting. So really, really fine pickings. In fact, let's just dive in, open this beauty up so you can see the glory of these pickings. Oh, wow, wow. Even more remarkable than I remember. Look how much golden and uh, copper buds there are here. It's so fine in terms of its uh, picking, in terms of the, the smallness or the delicacy of those leaves that it's, you know, when you open it, don't be surprised to see that it comes off because it's very hard when you're compressing such fine material to get it to stick together unless you do a very, very hard compress, which we don't like. So here it is. Oh, the nafe is upside down. So that's an interesting, interesting feature. Milk Float Nomad. So as I said, this is Gong Ting picking, which is the finest picking. What we mean by that is it's the smallest picking, the most delicate picking, which includes a lot more buds, which you can see here. These, wow, look at that. Look at how many copper colored buds there mixed amongst these black, like raisin black brown. Again, very small leaves, very, very fine picking. Gong Ting pickings. So we're gonna quickly scope this tea and then we're gonna dive into a full 10 step, a full 10 step tasting. I haven't tasted this tea yet. Um, and I'm always excited, always a little bit nervous, but uh, I, I like to shoot from the hip and give you my initial tasting notes. I hope that you like these. I mean, I could sit and, and really sort of craft my flavor notes a little bit, but I think it's nicer if I shoot from the hip a little bit. So we're gonna dive into a full 10 step tasting. I cannot wait. So scope on this season, this is spring 2010. So this has been aged loose since its fermentation process, which was done in 2010 for 10 years, really allowed it really to rest, age and to release all of that wardoy aroma so that we're getting a very clear character to the tea. So it was pressed for us this year, 2020. So it's a 10 year old ripe pu'er. The cultivar is the Daye Jong variety. The origin is Bulang mountainous area in Yunnan in uh, China. The picking on this is, as we've seen, very fine picking. So this is a bud and one or two leaves. I mean, you know, it will, it will, what did I write here? Yeah, I wrote a bud and up to three leaves, but really it's more like bud and one or two leaves with the fineness of this picking. And the elevation is 1,500 meters approximately. Right, I am gonna be brewing this up in a Kyusu. I know, I normally, whenever I'm doing these, these initial tastings, I always say that I like to brew in porcelain and I do because it gives you the most sort of neutral um, tasting notes. Tokunami clay is a little bit more, well, a lot more um, uh, hard compared to Jen Shui, compared to uh, 
Chow Jo even, similar to Chow Jo, but you know, it's going to have an effect, but it's not going to have as big an effect as say a Zersha uh, Yixing clay pot. So I'm going to be doing it in this, but you know, I will be obviously doing a separate tasting in porcelain to see how the notes differ. And I'll be writing my tasting notes on the website in porcelain, when brewed in porcelain. But I just thought, you know what? I feel like brewing in a tokoname clay. So this is 170 mil. Am I going to weigh this? What did I write actually? I wrote five grams, so we should do be doing about eight grams. Let's let's weigh it up. You know why not? I know I normally eyeball this, but sometimes it's nice to weigh things up. So what I'll do is I am going to first break into this baby milk float nomad. Well, there's plenty already out. Oh, look at that! It just sort of just comes off with the barest of flaking. So in fact, you can sort of shake this cake a little bit and you'll get probably a good session out of it. Let's see, is that enough? Let's weigh it up. We'll weigh it up. I'm not gonna weigh it up in the Kyusu actually. I'm gonna weigh it up in this Gen Shui cup. So I brought some Gen Shui here just cause I wanted to see what the Gen Shui would do as well. You know, always good to experiment. This is what I love about Gong Fu Brewing is there's always a new way to brew your tea. Um, or there's always, ooh, ooh, lost a bit. I'll get it later. I'm not gonna go scrounging around on the floor now, but I'll get it later. Um, so yeah, it's always nice to, just to test out different materials. Well, that's 8.5, so that'll do. Looking good. Right, I'm gonna put that down to the side here. I have another one here just so that we can remind ourselves of the cover. Yes, I know it's a luxury for me to have be surrounded by lots of cakes, even some after party enchanter. I'm sure there's a few out there who are thinking, why, why, why can't I get hold of it? You know, we keep obviously some of the cakes for ourselves, for our little museum, tea museum that we're building. Very small boutique museum. Maybe we'll open it up one day to the public. I'm talking about my home, of course. I'm not, not, not actually having a museum. Right, let's warm up this Kyusu. So we've done the eyes dry leaf, beautiful sort of carobs, raisin black browns, and this abundance of small copper colored buds. Warm up the teaware. Nice, right, let's throw these leaves in. It's great when you bring in a Kyusu, it gets to really spread out. That means you're getting a lot of surface area that's um, being activated by the heat. So let's see how it, it works in terms of aroma. Obviously it's not then sort of drawing and narrowing to uh, sort of concentrate the aroma, but let's see what we get. Tons and tons of aroma. I am getting raisins. Raisins and, and cream. I'm getting like a rum raisin ice cream. Yeah. There's a nut, nutty note going on as well. Rum, rum raisin ice cream. The nutty note is toasted hazelnuts. Oh. And um, a distinct, very smooth, very sweet alcoholic aroma. That fermentation. Again, the, the 10 years, first of all, clearly a very high quality fermentation has happened here. Really, really high quality. Uh, we talked about it with After Party Enchanter. The expertise in the fermentation, I mean, After Party Enchanter was a bit of an anomaly because it was, I can't remember the age, but I think it was a 2013 or 14 uh, tea. And yet, it, just a year or two years after it had been fermented, it was supreme, amazing. Um, so goes to show the level of detail and skill in the fermentation process of After Party Enchanter. And I think that this, this tea is right up with that level of skill. You can smell it. It's just got this really um, clearly crafted uh, aromatic profile. Oh. Rum raisin, toasted hazelnuts, pralines, ice cream, 
brown bread ice cream, deep dark caramel ice creams. Um, and yeah, that rum note, but a very smooth aged rum note. Right, let's uh, give this a quick rinse. And boost the temperature up. So we'll pour this water away. Good thing about Kyusu is you don't need the filter because it has its own filter inside as you can see once I move away all of these leaves. You can see this filter here, all clay. Oh, oh, the smell of those wet leaves. Oh, what a delight. It smells like, yeah, just like the cover, it's got that sort of, um, See, the cover was based on Ile Flottante. You know what an Ile Flottante is? Flottante? Ile Flottante, I'm probably saying that very badly, uh, which is this uh, French dessert. Let me just bring this over here in case that camera's not picking it up. It's that French dessert um, that you get, which is sort of meringue floating on top of a, uh, usually sort of a, a custard base, usually drizzled with a sort of deep, dark caramel syrup. Right? So this tea definitely has got that dessert-like quality to it. It's got that custard, but I'm getting a lot of that deep caramel um, syrup, which is drizzled all over the top of it. Oh, so, so uh, dessert-like, but in a very, very uh, mature, like raisins soaked in rum, deep dark caramels, custards, a bit of breadiness there. There's a sort of um, brioche. We're in French patisseries and, and French desserts, so brioche is going on there as well. Really, really that, um, that yeasty, fresh baked brioche smell. And there's a mineral note happening that is reminiscent of cement, like cement powder in there, which when you think about it in your sort of uh, sensorial part of your brain, um, has a sort of similar smell to it, to um, sort of flour and icing sugar mixed together. Am I making this up in my head? But in my head, that, that makes sense. So sort of cement powder, icing sugar, sort of combination, Il flottante, lots and lots of deep dark caramels and very, very rummy. Very, very rummy. Froggy gets first taste. I am going to be doing infusion counting on this one. So we'll start at number one over here and we will work through them. And um, we'll see. Judging by the smell, that sort of alcoholic smell, I'm wondering how this is going to make me feel. Okay, so brew times with this kind of tea, when it's so small in terms of the, the leaves and buds, you can be relatively quick. I think it's going to go dark pretty quickly. So we'll give it about 10 seconds and then we will pour it out. I think that that's probably enough. Here we go. Yep, 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 yep. Nice, deep, dark color. It's gonna get darker. So we're just sort of awakening everything here. Mm. A little bit of that, a little bit of rippled dark chocolate in that brioche, but mostly, m mostly a brioche aroma. Mm. Okay, so we're gonna try it in the porcelain first. I'll put this down here. Right, cheers everybody. Milk Float Nomad. Texture. Smooth, oily. Yeah, very oily texture. Very lubricating, slippery. Mm. I would call it, 
medium thick, but my assumption is that on second infusion, when it really starts to extract more, it's gonna become even thicker. So I'd say it's sort of medium thick, moving towards thick. Mm. Mm. Just getting to know it. This is what I mean about shooting from the hip. It's, uh, it's hard to just come straight out with flavor notes, even though they're, they're sort of f flicking around in my head. It's because it, what's lovely about this is it has, um, I, I, I'm sort of seeing two places. I'm seeing, on one hand, I'm seeing a, um, a, a, a sort of a, a French uh, bakery, I mean, not bread, but the sort of brioches and custards and those milk biscuits that we have. You probably recognize that. If you, if you don't, then um, you've probably never seen them before. But these milk biscuits that are very sort of, um, sort of simple in a way, but, but just a lovely sort of slightly malty, milky taste. I'm getting that brioche, I'm getting that custard. So that's the one sort of arena, that, that, that French dessert arena. And on the other hand, I'm picking up um, a little bit of um, a pottery sort of place, like a little bit of, we talked about the cement on the, the dry leaf, a little bit of sort of a, the aroma of like when you walk into a potter's and it's getting a little bit of that clay. So this uh, poor, this right poor is less in the woody notes. Um, and more in the mineral sort of clay notes. Mm, lovely finish, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so I'm getting sort of clays and a little bit of sort of wet stone moving. Uh, and that sort of is, is, is the, the finish. At the beginning, it's very, very luscious with those creamy notes and those baked bread notes. Um, and a deep, dark, syrupy note, which is, again, that syrup which is normally drizzled over a um, il flottante or maybe a creme uh, caramel, you know, that deep, deep, dark, similar color to this syrup, which is, um, which is in a creme brulee, uh, no, creme caramel. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, the finish ends on that mineral note, that slightly clay note, and then moves into a brightness. And that brightness is kind of fruity. Yeah, like um, baked oranges. So if you've taken um, oranges and you slice them thin and then you put them in, a, in an oven on low and you just sort of are, are, are not giving it a, a toasted note, but just, just concentrating and drying the aromatics so that they become a little bit uh, more deeper. Baked oranges. Hmm. Okay, moving on to infusion number two. We're at uh, 93 degrees here. I'm just gonna bump it up a little bit. Um, 95 would be fine for me. Mm, interesting, already feeling something, but I'll dive into that once I've had a couple of infusions. So, flavor profile, definitely very um, uh, reminiscent of how we tasted it a couple of months ago, as is reflected in the cover. So those, um, custards, meringues, milky biscuits, um, and then deeper, more of the rums, like a rum syrup, rum baba, those sort of notes, but not as casky or as sort of, uh, yeah, like um, uh, bourbon cask note, which is in fig dipper. So fig dipper is our other currently in stock Right, Pu'er, and that definitely has more of a sort of, I would say, mature rum casks and um, 
wood, woodsiness there. Whereas this, there's much less wood, woodiness and more of the pottery, the clay, the ceramics, those kinds of notes. For those of you who've walked into a ceramic studio before, imagine that smell. And then imagine you're sitting, eating sort of a bowl of, of, of custard and, and drizzled with like dark syrup or a rum baba or a, or a creme caramel. That will give you some idea. And then the, the, the look how much darker this is. I'll show this liquor to the camera. Um, and then this fruitiness is a sort of baked oranges, but it's something else as well. I'll you try and dive a little bit deeper into that. So focus on that deep, dark. Look at that. That is a luscious looking poor, right poor. And if this is scaring you, if you are not somebody who's really sort of uh, down with ripe pours or you haven't tasted ripe pours, don't be scared by the darkness of this liquor. That doesn't, a lot of people sort of associate that with a, um, like a bitter brew, like you, you're imagining a black tea. If a black tea was that dark, then you'd go, oh my gosh, that's, that's gonna be too strong. It's smooth, it's silky, it's gentle in its own way. Right, a little bit more in the porcelain. Definitely getting a heating sensation already. Mm. Mm. Second infusion, always a winner. Um, so now it's moved into much thicker territory. Mm. Thick, oily, creamy, moving to that ceramic um, cleanliness. You know, how you want a ripe poor to have that cleansing sensation. So great with meals. I have been drinking so much ripe pua recently with my, with my meals. Amazing the difference it makes you feel. So I'm trying to focus not on those creamy notes because we've discussed them already, but on what is that fruity note? Baked orange, as I said, but it's also got a brightness to it. You know what it is? Pear drops. So um, it's a pear flavor, but it's almost like when you have them in, in candy and in sweets, it's got a sort of almost uh, overwhelming, over the top sort of um, aromatic to it. It tastes slightly almost artificial. I don't know if pear, I guess pear drops are artificial, but it's got that, that note to it, the terps or the, the, um, the terpenes which are used in the flavoring of pear drops. Mmm. And it's also got that deep, dark, nutty, uh, toasted coconut. You know, if you go to uh, Thailand um, and, or you go to Brazil, I think in, in Brazil, I remember having a lot of this, this deep, uh, usually I think, I don't know if it's baked or fried, but very, very deep, dark coconut pieces, lovely to, to to munch on. Or in Thailand, they have got those, uh, those deep sort of palm, palm sugar, palm sugar and deep dark coconut, like grated up, mixed together in those dumplings, whether they can't, canom, canom tam, canom tan. Can, I'll have to look it up afterwards, but these deep um, uh, palm sugar and coconut mixed and stuffed into those glutinous rice dumplings. It has a bit of that going on. It's sort of not in your face, but it's there mixed in with the, that, those rum alcohol notes. Mmm. And creamy. I'm still getting a bit of rum raisin ice cream. So I hope that the palate is starting to reveal itself to you. Think of creams, custards, milks. Think of dark palm sugars, dark caramels, Rum babas, uh, raisin soaked in rum, um, yeah, rum raisin ice cream. And then ending with this sort of um, dark baked oranges and pear drops. <laughs> Did not disappoint. Mm. Okay, finish, 
finish on this, as I said, it leaves you with a very cleansing finish. The dryness on my tongue is a very cleansing dryness. Nothing that's sort of uh, very physical in the sense of puckering and pulling, just more um, clean, fresh. It's got a freshness in my mouth, cooling. Definitely very cooling and juicy. The juiciness is not immensely sweet, like a lot of uh, teas that I've tasted recently, because I've been drinking a lot of green teas, but very, very um, clean, cleansing. Yeah, I mean, gr this will be a great one with, with uh, meals, for sure. Uh, it'll be amazing with meals. Third infusion, let that start brewing while I dive into the smell of that empty Gongdao Bay. Let's see what we're getting here. Hmm. Now I'm getting a little bit more of that casky note. It's sort of a, a oh, casky is the wrong word. A slight burnt chocolate brownie note, but the creaminess is still there. Like a, um, as if you're having dark chocolate brownies with like a creme fraiche. So I'm just sort of giving you a roll call of all of my favorite foods or favorite desserts in flottant. I love creme brulees, no creme, I keep saying that, creme caramels, rum raisin ice creams, um, those canom tan, canom tam, um, those, those Thai dumplings, palm sugar and, and, uh, and deep coconut and dark chocolate brownies, creme fraiche making me hungry, have not eaten today. Right, this is infusion number three. Let's taste it in the, in the, the Gen Shui. So we're gonna do a taste comparison between porcelain and Gen Shui. If you've not done this before and you don't have a clay pot, you know, clay cups are great because the effect of clay is almost instantaneous. Just leave it a couple of uh, 10 seconds or so. Um, and you're gonna have the same effect and it's gonna be slightly different because obviously clay has a different heat retention, which means it's gonna brew slightly differently, but you can still get the effect of the clay in a clay cup. The surface of this liquor, um, I don't know if you can see it, but you're gonna have to take my word for it, has got tea fluff on it. So those buds are still fluffy, the giving tea fluff, which is again gonna affect the texture. You can see that bubble there. It has got a nice thickness to it. Here we go. Infusion number three, ooh, creamier. Mm. Ooh, creamier, milkier. Mm. Milk biscuits and that custard. Wow, really rounding out the creaminess. And that's surprising me. In the third infusion, it's getting creamier. Normally, as the infusions go on, you get more minerality, but that is definitely the creamiest one yet. Right, let's taste it in the Gen Shui. Mm. Yeah. Even thicker. Very, very voluptuous, luscious, oily. Mmm. Changes the flavor slightly. Ironically, less of the clay note, less of that sort of ceramic pottery note, and more malty and biscuity, more of those milk biscuits. Right, I'm gonna roll through some infusions and I'll come back and let you know how this tea makes me feel. So this is infusion number six. I haven't, I haven't had, I've only had a couple of more infusions, but I'm pretty clear on the body sensation, which is, slightly, uh, a little bit giddy, a little bit, you know, that, that rum uh, alcohol note is definitely in effect. You can feel a little, a little bit lightheaded, but overall still very clear, very bright. I can imagine having very nice long conversations with this. It reminds me a lot of After Party Enchanter in the sense of a sort of late night, 
you know, into the early hours conversations about, you know, the the more sort of the, the guts of life, you know, the, the deeper issues in life rather than the day to day. Very, very much got that sort of bright, clear, I can imagine being very uh, focused on it. Um, even though it does have a slightly sort of high giddy feeling to it, it's very, very gentle, um, very cleansing. Very, it would be an amazing digestive, sort of warming, but, but very cooling in the, in the mouth and very cooling in the lungs. Um, I would advise against probably drinking this tea thinking it's going to be your late night sipper if you want to go to bed because of those finer pickings the because of the gong ting pickings it definitely has got a little bit more of an energizing feel to it this will definitely keep you going keep you up it's not going to be a sort of winding down tea this is definitely into the wee hours on a friday night or during the day or like you know your dinner digestive if you feel like you're going to be staying up relatively quite a few hours afterwards and the taste just continues to have this sort of bready briochey note mm. it's just warm and and um and dessert-like um, in its sort of yeasty breadiness to it and that those milk biscuits and the meringues and the and the custards this persists and you can see the color is starting to lighten at infusion number six but you can definitely get many more infusions out of this um, you know I think we wrote on the packaging up to 12 um, but you know brew it for long for long periods of time you can do some forgotten brews on this this is going to be a very very forgiving tea because of the fact that it's so creamy and rich let's take a look at those leaves I tell you what I'll, just for contrast I'll put some in here so you can see the fineness of this picking you can see the fineness of this picking here and as always the color has sort of evened out so you can't see those copper buds anymore you're just getting that very lovely sort of rich soil brown color to the buds which do have some good texture these buds and leaves definitely got some nice texture to them and the fermentation process has been done in a skillful way it's not all sort of broken up you can still see the individual leaves. Um, very, very nice. So there you go. Milk Float Nomad. After Party Enchanter to the sequel. But that's not to say that it doesn't stand in its own right with its own reputation. Here we go. Milk Float Nomad. Available right now. That's it, T-Heads. Check out our other videos, Taste Our Teas, wherever you are in the world by browsing mayleaf.com and come visit us if you're ever in London. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.